A friend of mine was asked the other day, uh, after a long discussion, if she had anything to add, and she said, I don't really have anything to add, but I have a lot to say. <laughs> uh, I, I hope I have something to add to this discussion. After all of the uh, all of the comments we have had, which I think have just been outstanding. Uh, one, one thing that occurs to me, though, is just how important religion and religious freedom is to so many different people, and how important it has been through our, our common history, uh, not just of this country, but going back you know, thousands of years. I, I want to um, to start maybe with some of the uh, some of the fundamentals. One of the questions uh, that Joe Stong suggested that um, we might want to address is where in the world does this business of religious freedom uh, actually come from? And we, we've had a, a comment earlier, uh, Reverend Benton mentioned this. Uh, what does the Constitution say? You know, the, the question of is separation of church and state, um, the wall between church and state, well, that's not in the Constitution. But what the Constitution says, it says Congress or the government shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, uh, and pro or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And it's really the free exercise thereof, which is what we have been talking about a lot tonight. And, and what does it mean to exercise religion freely? And, and why do we have this free exercise? Uh, as Americans, we can, of course, go back to the, um, the Declaration of Independence, which says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this is really the foundation that uh, brought about the separation of the United States, what was to become the United States, from uh, Great Britain. Within the Catholic Church, uh, we actually look at a lot of these provisions which we recognize in American law. And, and by the way, uh, just so I know that I'm very welcome here, I am a Catholic and I am a lawyer. So I guess I'm glad that uh, things have changed in the last couple of hundred years. Uh, but anyway, it, the, the Catholic Church, as Father Clark has mentioned, you know, has tried to evolve its understanding of religious freedom. And one of the places where we look today to the, uh, our expression of religious freedom comes from the Declaration on Religious Freedom, which was adopted in 1965 by the Second Vatican Council. And just a footnote for those of you who are, are not Catholic and are not familiar with the Vatican Council, and certainly the Second Vatican Council, uh, there have been in the history of the church uh, what we as Roman Catholics count as 20 ecumenical councils, which are the meetings of all the bishops of the world uh, getting together and resolving or trying to resolve certain religious issues, going back to the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Ephesus, and uh, we count the, the Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council, which uh, occurred between 1962 and 1965 as the 20th of those ecumenical councils. And that council produced 16 different documents on various aspects of church life and uh, of Catholic belief. And one of the most important of those was the Declaration of, on Religious Freedom. And much of what is in there is very similar to what uh, we understand as American law, United States law. And that's not surprising because the, the bishops, and there were about 2,500 bishops who were involved, if, if you can imagine a committee of 2,500 bishops meeting in Rome. Uh, and they, uh, but the bishops who really pushed that were the American bishops. And the expert, uh, and they obviously retained experts to help them with all the various issues, Probably the leading expert was a, a, an American Jesuit by the name of John Courtney Murray. And he reflected on the American experience, and a lot of the American experience went into this document on, on religious liberty. Uh, 
And the um, and this for us shows where this concept of religious liberty comes from. And it comes, as I think Father Kavanaugh mentioned this earlier, it comes from the inherent dignity of the human person. In fact, this, this document, a lot of Vatican documents are written in Latin, and you know, if you know classical Latin, Latin likes to begin uh, an important document with sort of key words. Um, and so the key words, the, this document is referred to as dignitatis humanae, human dignity, about human dignity. Um, and where does this human dignity come from? Uh, for us, it comes from, from two places. It comes from reason, and it comes from the Word of God. It comes from Scripture. And the Scripture we go back to, all the way back to the book of Genesis, uh, where it says that God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And we, we can work our way through, through scripture and through history to, to show the, the place of, of the human person in, in Catholic social teaching and I think in all faith-based faith uh, teaching, tradition and social teachings, it goes back to the dignity of the human person. If you deny the dignity of the human person, then really all the rest of it is, is just made up stuff. One of the other things the council says, and I think this is important, with regard to religious liberty, Second Vatican Council said, within due limits, no men or women are, should be forced to act in a matter against their convictions, nor are any persons to be restrained from acting in accordance with their convictions in religious matters, in private or in public, alone, or in association with others. This is our, our, our foundation point. Um, and I think it's interesting that, that each of our speakers has reflected on, on the value of, of the human person and how their tradition has uh, enhanced the value of not only the individual, but also the value of society by advancing religious freedom. I also appreciate what uh, Rabbi Haas had to say about the uh, the benefit, the wondrous benefit that we have in the United States in having a document which begins, which the First Amendment begins with religious freedom. And I think it is important for us as we sit here tonight to, to recognize that and to thank God for that but at the same time, to recognize that we have to be constantly vigilant to make sure that we preserve this right that we have for our children and for our grandchildren. Bishop Hartmeyer mentioned yesterday in his, his homily uh, that on the face of this earth, there are about three quarters of the people on the face of the earth do not have the religious liberty that we have. Uh, Father Kavanaugh mentioned a number of, of instances in the United States where I think religious liberty is getting weakened somewhat by the government. But I think we also have to acknowledge that around the world there are so many instances where religion is under uh, a much more obvious attack than uh, we certainly have in the United States. Two weeks ago, uh, all the bishops of Catholic bishops of the United States met in, in Atlanta in their quarterly conference. And one of their speakers was a bishop from Iraq. And he described the pain that his community is feeling in Iraq through religious intolerance. One of the things he said was that they had a, a seminary for uh, Catholic priests uh, in Baghdad that had been taken over by the by the United States government as part of the invasion of Iraq. And he said that because of that, because the government had, the new government, the United States government had gotten involved in that seminary, that the, uh, the Christians had gotten a bad reputation because 
not because of anything they did, but because the, the seminary building was being identified with this invading force of US troops. And that this combination of government and, and religion was actually ending up hurting religion. Now, there have been a, a, a number of, of instances of, of discrimination, which we have mentioned. And uh, I have to mention a little bit this HHS mandate, which uh, is a great concern to the, the Catholic Church right now. And, and let me give you a little bit, a little, flesh this out a little bit more. Um, where this comes from. The um, Affordable Care Act, everybody knows the uh, decision from the Supreme Court last week, but that really doesn't have anything directly to do with, that uh, decision doesn't have anything directly to do with the mandate that we have been talking about. And actually, the Catholic Church has supported for many, many years this concept of universal health care. So we have largely wanted to see a law which would expand health care. As somebody mentioned, uh, the church does not take a position and doesn't have the expertise to take a position on how that should be done. It could be a single payer, or maybe the system that it currently has uh, been found constitutional. They may be good systems. The church is not taking a position on that. The church is concerned about some of the religious aspects of that law. One of them is the lack of con uh, conscious conscience protection that existed in the original law, and also the, the failure of the law to provide uh, coverage for immigrants even when they pay their own uh, even when they pay their own insurance. But essentially, the church is in favor of health care for all because of the human dignity. And we, we can trace that even in our own teachings back to, uh, back to the teaching, at least to John Paul, uh, Pope John XXIII in several of his uh, encyclicals back in the early 60s, and certainly to, um, to the Second Vatican Council. But anyway, the, the church has largely supported the idea of, of universal health care. Um, the concern that we have with the so-called HHS mandate is the uh, Affordable Care Act defined uh, services that ought to be in the insurance policies that are given to, to people, uh, either by mandate or in these insurance exchanges, and that one of the concern, one of the requirements is, is there, is that there be a full range of reproductive services, which include contraception, uh, uh, Abortion, abortifacients, and uh, sterilization, and those sorts of things, which are problems. Now, the interesting thing is, the federal government has said religious institutions who have a conscience problem with that don't have to provide those services. The problem is, how do you define a religious organization? And this is where we have the problem with two aspects of the government's definition of what is a religious organization. One is that it serves only its own people, its own members of its own denomination, and two, that it hire only members of its own denomination. And as Kat so eloquently said, this, is, this kind of an approach to social services, its services to our brothers and sisters, is directly contrary to our understanding of the scriptures. Our job as Christians is not to serve just our own people, just our own Catholics. Uh, they are to serve all people. Uh, as she said, uh, not because we are Catholics or because we're Jews or because we're Baptists, so we serve just Jews or Catholics or Baptists, but we're all called to serve all of our brothers and sisters.